Hello, everyone. It's Leo, and this is the second volume of Cinecast. Actually, this is the first time I call it that, but it's kind of like a podcast in which I call someone to discuss a certain topic on Precure, or Magical Girls maybe in the future, or anime in general, I don't know. And this talk is kind of like in a podcast format. Today, I have here with me Baka Inu Bashiri. Hello there. Inu is someone I got to know through Twitter, I think. Uh, yes. Because of the channel, right? And then we started talking about Precure, we started talking about anime, and Inu is a very big Precure fan, right, Inu? Uh, so please enlighten us on how you got to know Precure for the first time. I would say that uh, there are bigger fans than I am, but sure, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, I first got exposed to it a long, let's see, 2004? I was in a. I had started a fan subbing group, and we had done a collaboration with another group, and we did a few episodes with because uh, we had a translator and they didn't, and that's where I got into it. But uh, then I started college, and I sort of fell out. But I kind of would see an episode here and there, and as I got down the road, <clears throat> um, I can't remember which. It may have been Heart Catch, kind of piqued my interest. A little bit more and so i saw some more of the series i didn't watch them all the way through and then of course my grad school started getting into uh my life and i had absolutely no time and i i fell out of all that and just recently i guess a couple of years ago or so maybe a year and a half ago i decided that i was gonna take the plunge and just get to know everything and anyone precure related and uh, so here I am with this loser. <laughs> Don't say that at all. <laughs> like, l there is something I need to tell the people that are listening about me and Inu, because we are the uncles of the Precure fandom. We're <sighs> one of the uncles, obviously, because there are lots of older fans, but we're like on the older range of age yeah. on the fandom. He, don't listen to him, though. He's the <laughs> oldest one. <laughs> oh, my God. Don't you dare. <laughs> But anyway, um, here we are today to talk about a very interesting topic, a topic I know every Precure fan loves, which are the mid-season cures. Uh, we chose this topic because now we're on to a new season. I know we've been having some problems with hiatus on Healing Good. Not like bad things are happening all around the world, but we have a fourth cure coming up in Healing Good Precure. We've seen her, we know her name, we know her design. And we thought, why not talk about all of the mid-season cures we have so far? So we chose this theme to do this. We decided to start with uh, Cure Passion and Bypass uh, Luminous and uh, Milky because there's more of a special variety of kind of second season cures, not necessarily mid-season cures. <laughs> yes. Even though they kind of are the the, the, uh, the progenitors, I guess, of... of of what the mid-season cure six ring or six ranger is supposed to be. Um, so we decided to start with Cure Passion, Ys or Setsuna, whatever your taste there. Um, Setsuna or uh, Cure Passion to me, though, is just probably the most well-balanced uh, mid-season cure, and that's kind of saying something that uh, you know if you get it right <laughs> the first time. Uh, you should congratulate yourself on it. Um, you know, I don't know. Just some of the facts about her. That, I mean, she was the first villain cure. She was also the ver the first cure to sort of reassert, like, I guess, her humanity or to turn her life around, you know, from evil to good. And to me, I think that this – I think that – the ones to to come later on, as they, at least from the villain perspective, that she's pretty much the gold or the platinum standard of how um, the villain mid-season cure is supposed to be, and pretty much is in one way or another. Um, she, like she debut, okay, so she debuts in episode one as East and Setsuna. We follow her along with love and then eventually we get her trans her uh, transformation in um, episode 23 is cure passion 
And then she doesn't fight with the girls, I believe, until an episode or two later after that. The one thing I really like about Passion is just her relationship with love and her family. Like, she essentially went, went from dead to nothing, to, to having nothing, to now having a family, a life, being happy, and and so on. And also her, her, <laughs> her, uh, Picaroon, her, uh, is it Picaroon? Is that what it's called? Her, Akaroon, basically, Akaroon. is like, yeah. yeah, is basically the coolest of, of all, I think. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah, to be able to be, teleport. Like, <laughs> yeah, and that was able to revive her in a way, right? Yes, that was yes. like uh, the essential. Like that was what's brought her to life again. That was pretty yes. cool. Yes, she was cloaked. She was cloaked or something another, um, and Akron couldn't find her. And then when she died, that cloak went away, and then found her and gave her basically a new life. Um, I also like that each t each member of the team, in one way or another. Uh, helped her with her, you know, reasserting as a human being, like Miki with her mannerisms, and Buki giving her like confidence to be on the dance team, and um, and and love of all, you know, just being wild. But uh... <laughs> yeah, her relationship with love is really something else. Like her relationship with all of them is great, but with love, it's obviously the best. It's the most fleshed out. Of the three and it's amazing like she found a sister in her she found a family she found a mother in love's mother as well yes so she was able to find a place of her own that's very very beautiful to like to after we see her story uh i believe that like up until today it's like if we look back to all the precure seasons i think that your passion was the one that was done the best <laughs> And like she was the first one, like be, as we said before, like before her, we had some prototypes here and there. Uh, we had um, in Splash Star, we had the two villains that ended up helping the cures in the last fight. But they never became cures. And now with right. passion, it was like the first time we had a mid-season cure per se. Um, it's like she left her mark in the franchise, and it became like a legacy, and it became like a, a staple of the Precure franchise. And it was done in such a good way. Like the writing in everything concerning Ease to her transformation into Setsuna is incredible. It's painful to watch her fight with love, like her fight with um, uh, with her and in the rain, and you know, like both of them giving their all in that fight. And, you know, loving trying to reach out to her. It was like something really, really beautiful. I absolutely loved it. And as I said, to me, up until today, she is the best of all. Like the mo the best written one. And she's not my favorite out of the mid-seasons. But if I had to choose like the best one, the one that was best written, I would say it's Cure Passion. And in that fight too, she was fighting. She was fighting Setsuna. Four sets in a. She was fighting. Yes. Yeah, she was. Yeah, definitely. And it's kind of interesting too, also that you know, like I we've said before, this particular series like was the the hinge whether Precure was going to continue or not. Yes. Yeah. Fresh was a big, big thing in Precure. Like it, before Fresh, we uh, we had some seasons that were very, very successful. We had some seasons that weren't very successful. But uh, Toy didn't uh, have this, this idea of continuing a franchise for a long time. Like if we take a look at franchises that came before Precure in Toy Animation Department, uh, we have Sailor Moon. We have that had five seasons. We have Oja Maju Do Mi, that, if I'm not mistaken, also had five seasons. And after Oja Maju Do Mi, Toy Animation started with Ashita no Naja, which is a very beautiful anime, by the way. But it's not a magical girl one, uh, and uh, it wasn't very successful. And then Precure came. So after five seasons, I think they were debating whether on to continue or not to continue. And I think that Fresh was that deal breaker. Like, let's do this. If this if it goes right, we keep on doing Precure. If it goes wrong, we end the franchise right here and we start something else. And, you know, Fresh, with all of the animation problem it has, it was very, very successful. It was amazing. And up until today, it's one of my favorite seasons as well. 
I love Fresh. I love it. And I'm glad that it happened and it kept Precure leaving for so long. So we'll go to Cure Sunshine next, Itsuki. Let's start with Hard Catch Precure. She was kind of, I don't want to step on any toes, but she was, she's the first Cure who wore basically clothes, wore like a, a non, she wore clothes that were not gender assigned. Like she wears the boys' uniform in school as opposed to the girls' uniform. Of course, we find out why she's acting like that, or not acting, but why she she takes it upon herself to project that image is because she has her brother who's supposed to uh, succeed the uh, for the dojo uh, happens to be happens to be illness. I don't think it ever said what he had, but it was. I think it was some type of pneumonia or something. So he was not very, he couldn't be very athletic. <clears throat> so at a young age, she took it upon herself to act and talk like a boy and handle herself like a boy and be strong, you know, in order to uh, take over the dojo. Um, but she also has kind of a flaw in herself in that she loves cute things. <laughs> and, uh, so we, and she's often mistaken for a boy, obviously. Uh, Subomi's little uh, three minute romance, <laughs> the cutest thing ever. <laughs> and uh, um, interesting, though, some, some stuff about her. Um, like when she's in her cure form, or excuse me, yeah, when she's in her c- civilian form, she uses uh, the pronoun Boku, which is a male. Mo- a male pro- pronoun, and while she's in her cure form, she uses watashi or atashi, which is a gender neutral pronoun that's usually used by females. So it's kind of like not only when she goes to cure sunshine, she throws away all of the all of the mask that she has to wear uh, in her civilian form. She was also our st- our second student council pre- uh, president be- because Cotton was the first one. Um. Interesting enough, um, her weapon is not, it is a, I don't think it, they, she calls it a tact. I think she calls it something else. Yeah, I think it's a tambourine, right? I, I don't remember the name of the, the, the weapon, but yeah, the weapon itself is a tambourine, right? And right. well, I, as I, I think you know that, but I love tambourines. So I'm all <laughs> for tambourines, you know? I love yeah. that she had a tambourine weapon and it looked incredible. I loved it. It was able to produce a defensive shield, and it was also capable of offensive attacks. Um, and her mascot also was capable of doing a shield. I'm guessing that's just because uh, Property was born at that time, so she got a different power, a different tact, I guess. I'm not sure. Well, yeah, that... we could say that. We could say that, or we could be more like realistic and think about why they d- release different weapons for different cures because they need to yes. sell different toys. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. The toy unfortunately, theory. Unfortunately, like, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately we need, like, we're, we, we, sometimes we get to analyze things in, in a more realistic light, which takes away the magic of it. But what can we do, right? I'm sorry. In a I... capitalist world. I'm sorry. I, I'm not capable of thinking like a six-year-old anymore. <laughs> right yeah i think like uh itsuki was a great character i think she added a lot and i think like um she as cure sunshine brought a lot as well and we're talking about a season as hard catch with two characters that were very big like as people and as cures you know as characters as like humans in their human lives and as cures as well like erika took all of the screen time to her with like her big personality and Tsubomi with her shy little ways also conquered everyone's hearts. But Itsuki found a way to capture all of our our hearts as well. And I think that as Cure Sunshine, she is the first example of a protective cure that works perfectly because she has lots of shield powers. She has buffing powers as well. And she is just incredible in that aspect. Like she is a protective cure that can actually protect her shields actually work, you know, and 
she can be offensive as well. I mean, she was, I don't know if it was karate. I don't know if they actually mentioned the, the, the fighting style that she had, uh, but you know, she, she was a big fighter. And when she became Kira Sunshine, she used that in the fights. And I loved seeing that. And I also love the design of Kira Sunshine. She is very beautiful. I love the hair. I love how like, the the honey colored hair she has itsuki has uh, becomes that beautiful bright yellow as cure yes. sunshine that that looks incredible and she like i think that she goes on to a very big transformation you know when she becomes cure sunshine i can see a very little itsuki very like way inside that heart but you know cure sunshine it seems that she takes over and you know i love that <clears throat> yeah it's like the cute version of the inner version inner cute version of Itsuki comes out. <laughs> yes. Versus the out harder shell, outer hard shell that she has to put on. The interesting thing that uh, in the trial of the silhouette, um, she had to end, end up facing herself over the, all of that as well. Uh, she had to face that she let her family down, that she let her brother down, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, I will fight, you know, to put a smile on my my uh, my brother's face and i will continue to be strong and train hard and i will i will uh love cute things <laughs> so it's kind of... <laughs> yeah i think that like the big message of that was like be you you know like we we have we all have pressures in our lives and we all have to deal with things that are like sometimes things we don't want to but you know sometimes we just have to throw away what people expect of us and be who we want to be. I think that's what more or less the message that they wanted to get across with her is like the positive side of that is like, be you. Doesn't matter yeah. what people expect of you. Like they, be yourself. they hit that, they hit that one out of the, out of the park. We'll go to our second uh, heart catch. Not really mid season cure quarter season cure <laughs> <laughs> cure moonlight or Yuri. So Yuri um, we know about her from episode one, from a, a dream that uh, Subomi's having on episode one. And it's a flashback of when uh, Moonlight lost her powers and lost her partner as well. And I, uh, interesting enough, both Erika and Itsuki have the same dream as well. So we're aware of her and we know that she's been a cure and but we don't really meet her until like later on in episode eight and i think the botanical garden is where she, she was visiting uh Sibomi's, uh grandmother and then we find out oh she was cure moonlight that was the girl in our in our dreams and uh she was very distant very uh didn't want to get involved because her heart her uh, heart flower had been wilted so she didn't want to get close. She didn't want to be friends with them. But eventually, of course, the two little <laughs> rugrats kind of got on, got to her. And so she wanted to save everyone in episode three. And I actually, you know what, since you really like this episode, why don't you, why don't you take it away? Well, I think Cure Moonlight is one of my favorite cures. I absolutely love her. So Mine too. like it's easy to talk about her. It's really easy for me to talk about her cuz she is she's a queen. She is like the definition of a queen. And uh, like Cure Moonlight, uh she lost a battle right at the start of the season and in that battle she lost the power to become Cure Moonlight and she also lost her partner Cologne. That was a very sad thing. And I think the Precure is never repeating that again. Like, this is, like, something that's very dark, considering we're talking about Precure. Like, we, I don't think we've had another mascot that was killed, like, during the season, like it happened with Cologne. And, you know, Moonlight, um, like, she spent most of the season as Yuri, having lost her powers and everything. And in episode 33 was when she was able to get her power back. Uh, different from the other three cures, she doesn't need her partner to be with her so that she can transform. She got the power back because the heart three uh, gave it to her. So she can transform without a mascot since she, her mascot is lost already. And so she can transform by herself. 
And when she becomes Kira Moonlight once more, she is introduced to the Hard Catch team. And like this is a very big moment in the season. But I will I'd I'd say that this is one of the biggest moments for me in the Precure franchise. Uh, she too. transforms uh, right at the end of episode 33. And episode 34 is one of my favorite Precure episodes ever. I absolutely love that episode. She she like kicks ass totally she <laughs> destroys everyone she's able to fight like the the generals because like usually in magical girls they're they fight the monsters but the generals are, are a little too strong for the cures themselves and then no she gets she just jumps right there and she gets there and she destroys everybody it was so nice you know it was incredible and you know after that i feel like uh you know she she integrates herself into the team. She feels at home. But I feel like uh, the, the moment she actually was able to open up like completely was at the end of the season, at the last fight, that she had like a very heartfelt talk with Tsubomi uh, when they were fighting Dune. So Sabaku, actually. It, I think it was Sabaku, not Dune yet. Uh, so, so like she, she had a big moment and a big open of heart. And that was just incredible i think that like kirman light i think you you we share the same feeling she is awesome she is one of the best and i absolutely love her you know i love her design i love the way they use purple with silver in her costumes and i love her powers i love the way she fights and i love the fact that she's older you know we have like we rarely have cures that are older and she's one of them. So I find that awesome. Not only that, she is the oldest one by a month. Oh yeah, you, you're right. Your you're right. other favorite your other favorite Yukari is right behind her. Yeah. Another queen. But we're not here to talk <laughs> about her. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean I, I like your Yuri so much because just I mean, imagine that happened. I mean, she lost her partner, she lost her powers, she lost her father. Then she accidentally, well, not accidentally, she kills her own, her half sister that she never knew, and then she finds her father, then loses her father again, <laughs> and it's, yeah, wow. Yeah. I think that like the narrative of Hardcash was very cruel to her. <laughs> it was like when I was watching that, I was like, oh, I can't believe they're doing that to her. You know, I mean, you, you don't ex expect that to happen in Precure, you know? unless it was sort of like I'm sunlight itsuki who has everything and i'm and then you see moonlight you know dark, it's not really darkness but kind of yin and yang sort of thing yeah yeah that's one way to see it i was sad you know like ultimately her story is very sad and like i think that one of the things i i get a little disappointed with hard catch was not giving her enough screen time after she joins the team uh because we're going to talk about a cure later on that i think that uh, followed more or less the same route as her, and but she had more screen time than her after she got introduced. And Kirimu Light is um, an interesting case of a cure uh, getting added later on. Like she was added in episode 33. We already knew about her. We already knew she existed. And Moonlight was a past cure. But then she gets reintroduced as Kirimu Moonlight again in episode 33. So like it's a little later than we what we usually have. But at that time, we didn't have like many examples of mid-season cures. But if you look at it today, she was one of the latest additions to a team. Yep. That was probably pushing it. Of course, that wouldn't be the last time they would do that either. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, there was a couple kind of things about her. She was the first uh, high schooler cure. Like you said, the older cure. Uh, she was the first uh, cure to have like family on both sides, like on the bad side and the good side. She was also the first cure to like, I guess, be number one and then be joined. Like she was number one, and then she was the last one to join. <laughs> so um, first, oh, first non-pink cure to actually appear in episode one. You know, the first thing that we see usually in the series. Yes. Um, and she was also the first cure uh, to lose her powers. I guess we can go on to uh, Sweet Pretty Cure. Yeah, let's do and let's do Sweet Pretty Cure. Another one of my favorite, favorite seasons. Yep. Oh my god, I love this. Yep. So onwards to Cure Beat. 
or Satan or Ellen. Um, she is our second villain cure, but she's also a mascot. So what a twist. <laughs> um, but she didn't start out that way. She st- she actually started out as a as a, not really a mascot, but a, a cat. And she was Hummy's best friend until she got brainwashed by Mephisto. But, you know, more or less, she lost her way first before that ever happened. So from jealousy. Um, interesting enough, whenever, um, of course, she's always shape shifting and pulling and trying to do things to uh, um, Hibiki and company and trying to. You know, get the tones away from. I mean, not the tone. Well, yeah, the tones and the the notes away from them. But uh, at one point, um, right before the, uh, um, oh, what was it called? The song of sorrow. Melody of sorrow, I think. Melody of sorrow. Yeah, before that was uh, sung. Um, she turned. She she just turns into her human self just out of nowhere into cure beat and uh that was just i mean it just it just happened and yeah, uh that was a very peculiar moment in precure i think yeah there was no lead up to it like you know i'm granting you this power it just happened like it was inside of her the whole time um and I don't think she actually fought. She, she just protected Hummy. I don't think she actually fought. Because I think she ran away. Yeah, she ran away uh, to Akko's grandfather's place. And, you know, she stayed there for a while. And, you know, they kept trying to get her to join the team, uh, Kanade and uh, Hibiki. But... You know, she was so remorse about all the bad things that she had done that she felt like she couldn't she, more. She couldn't forgive herself. And if she couldn't forgive herself, how could other people forgive her? Which she, but she's got it upside down. Um, and she meets this boy. I think his name was Mamoru, I think was. And anyways, he was it's just a little side character that had had ran away from home. And, uh, you know, and she, She's kind of in the same situation, you know. She ran away from home. And I see the parallel of this uh, with Setsuna. Setsuna, you know, when she turned, she didn't accept, you know, the cures. She ran away, and she wandered around until she accidentally ran into Love's mother. Well, in this instance, you know, Ellen ran into this boy. And this boy made her realize that family was everything. If you have someone who loves you, you know, be with them. Yeah, I think that uh, the, both of them like are, are villains turned into cures. I think that uh, in Beat's case, they looked uh, up to Setsuna to see what they have done there to bring here again what what worked with Setsuna to do with her. Obviously, she's very different. Like all the things that go around her are very different from what happened to passion, obviously, but you know, there are some similarities here and there. Uh, I, I think that uh, when she became Cure Beat, it was a very nice episode. She brought like, th- the setting was very nice, you know, the rain and the drama and how she was confused and not really understanding what was going on and how she became Cure Beat. Uh, that was very interesting. And um, I think that like Beat is a very, peculiar character you know and uh when she transforms into cure b she is so cool i just love her design i just love her weapon which is a guitar how cool can that be and she can play a guitar riff with her hair like yeah that's crazy she also got locked into that into that form too she was not she could no longer transform back yeah that was a little sad actually that was a little sad like when she became cure beat she couldn't be satan anymore the cat like i kind of understand that because i think that like satan was really um really marked as a villain uh but you know as you said before she was brainwashed by Mephisto, but he used something that was already inside of her, which was her jealousy. And I like that, actually, because it makes, like, it shows that people can 
have those feelings and turn into something good later on. You know, like it doesn't mean that you're doomed. Oh my God, you feel jealousy in your life until you're doomed forever. And no, you can change. You can, you can redeem yourself. And that's what she did. You know, she gained that power and she just used it to redeem herself and to do what she felt that she had to do to undo her bad deed. Yeah, I, and eventually she does regain, or I guess not really regain, but she begins to start trusting uh, Hibiki and, and Kanade because she starts to form a friendship with them. I think they went to the beach the first time and she had so much fun and uh, eventually um, she gets a school uniform and starts to go to school with them and and uh, you know just they just is a regular girl. Yeah, that was and, awesome. And, you know, a, a far cry from what she was doing. You know, before then, we go to the next one, Cure or uh, Sweets, uh, number two, quarter quarter of the way. <laughs> Cure, uh. Cure Muse, or actually, she wasn't. She wasn't quarter away. She was. She was already there. We just didn't. She was just pretending to be somebody else. Uh, Cure Muse or Akko. So, <laughs> the little brat. <laughs> uh, so after reading a little bit more, she actually did have her powers in episode one. We don't see her, but she makes a comment that. Uh, she actually got her powers uh, the day that, Mef that Mephisto in invaded uh, Major Land, and then she ran to Earth. She is the youngest cure out of every every season. She's the youngest cure. She is also the smallest cure, as in height. Like Cure uh, Fortune and Sword, uh, Akko um, already had her powers at the very beginning. And she was disguising herself as I don't really know. She was in black leather. Oh my god, that that's <laughs> incredible! <laughs> I love that look on her. <laughs> and I love that there. There's there was one episode that she got the boots of. Oh, she got the boots to to she needed to get like to get something that she couldn't like she couldn't get that high because she's very short. She no, used I think. Boots. I think, she, that was, I think that was I think she was fighting with uh, uh, Hibiki and Kanade because they could get uh, some of the notes that were higher up. So yeah, she got her boots exactly. out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, she's awesome! <laughs> and I and then there was that one scene where she was getting the with the cat out of the tree with the stilts and like she was so talented with it and everybody was like, huh? <laughs> so, yes. yeah, you're right. You're but, right. But she yeah, debuts. I... She debuts in episode six. We see her, and of course, she's a little brat. I think she even like was really rude to Hibiki. Uh, and then ele uh, episode eleven is when we see the masked cure muse. And you know, for a, a, what was it like twenty something episode? No, it was like twenty, almost twenty five episodes. We don't, we don't like know who she is. Just some character. I mean, yeah, not some yeah. character, but yeah, we know she's a cure, but uh, we don't really know like her identity. And I remember at the time, it was a big mystery to the Precure fandom. We didn't have the leaks we have nowadays, and we actually believed that it was going to be Seika and Wan, friends to mm -hmm. kind of the Hibiki, like the side characters. And Toy even trolled us with fake designs of those two characters as cures. And cure, uh, like, cure Symphony. Cure or... Symphony and Beat. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, they didn't make it, thank God. Because, like, okay, they, their designs are amazing. But I absolutely love Cure Muse. I absolutely love Cure Muse. She is my favorite yellow cure. And, I, like, one thing I love about her is that Akko is able to be a very rude person you know she is like she has the the poetic license to be rude to everyone and the <laughs> show doesn't care about that you know she can well, be she... rude to everybody and you know that that's never really a point because i feel like sometimes the character in sweet are so dumb that you can understand her being rude to them you can understand <laughs> her her mood in like 
in being like, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying that. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm losing time with you saying some things like that, you know? And that that's just incredible. And when she transforms into Cure Muse, it's interesting that she is very cute. Like she's very powerful, but she's also very cute. Like there's a big transformation shift. And I love when they do that because it feels like two different entities. You know, Akko is one entity and Cure Muse is another. Like she gets a new persona when she becomes Cure Muse. I love, I love that. I think a little bit of that though had to come that she started to trust the cures. She didn't trust them at first because she wanted to save her father. Which is, I mean, it's kind of funny because the first lines that come out of her mouth and I think it was like episode five or she tells Hibiki to get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> this this little bitty thing that probably she can't even see yeah. has to look down to see. <laughs> <laughs> and like, it's interesting because like there were, at that time, there were lots of possible characters to be Kira Muse and we didn't really know who was actually going to be the one. And Akko wasn't really like, oh my God, I'm sure it's her. I'm like, it wasn't really clear that she was going to be the one that was going to be chosen to be Cure Muse. Yeah, I and... thought, I, I really thought Juan was going to be one. I, I like Juan. I think she's a cool si support character. I wish she yeah, had actually. she was nice. She was nice. Yeah. And like, you know, I, I really liked when Akko became Muse, like the episodes. She became Cure Muse in episode 35. And after a suite, we never had a cure being introduced as late to a season. Like, it was very, very late. And in Moonlight's case, for example, she was introduced in episode 33, but we already knew her design. And so, like, when the second ending started, Moonlight was already in it. And when the second ending of Sweet Precure started in episode 20-something, they did not put Cure Muse in the ending. They put Hummy dancing in her spot. So they didn't really <laughs> reveal her design right at the bat. Like, we had to wait for her to join the team so that they could put her in the ending. And, well, I complained a little bit about, about Moonlight and how they didn't really give her much screen time after she joined the team because I think they did very, very well with Akko. They gave her a lot of screen time after she joined. There were lots of episodes focused on her. And, you know, she, she was able to concentrate the story around her for a while. That was pretty nice. And, you know, her story was tied to the bigger story of Sweet as well. Mm -hmm. And we also have her being uh, enemies with her own father. But this time, the father didn't die. She was able to get him back alive. Yeah. That's when she ripped off her mask the first time, wasn't yes. it? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And I think she even punched him in the face, which knocked him <laughs> in his senses, to his senses, I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. She, I think she did. Yeah. She, like, I love her powers. She she's a great fighter. Now we go to our everyone's favorite. <laughs> oh my god. You're going to be hated for that for sure. You are going to be hated. You're getting a lot of you're going to be canceled. Inu's the mana, getting canceled. The the mana Let's show. Let's talk about Doki Doki Precure and the mid season cure that came with it. The, the Ida Mana show. Oh no, I, I'm fine. I like I like Doki Doki. I'm just I'm just joking. Yeah, so we're Doki Doki. So we get this is the first time this has ever happened. Uh we get basically the it's it's usually we, we find her civilian form some few episodes before something happens, she she becomes a cure, then she's integrated into into the group. Yeah, well, right at the bat we get to know cure ace. Yeah, so they did it in reverse this time. <laughs> so yeah. they tried something new. Yeah, so we yeah, so Ace, you know, they were about to be defeated and they needed an ace in the hole, and there you go. Um if if you know poker terms. So she was and so she's the first cure, like you just said, to 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 appear without me without meeting or interacting in her civilian form ever and like akko she's the second youngest cure uh by like half a year or a year or something like that interesting she's the first cure to sort of mature as she, when she transforms 
Uh, she gets she gets bigger or she grows taller. Let me clarify that. Um, and, and we don't know this like right away, but she, like herself, like her physical being, is actually just a half of another person. And Regina is the other half, and Agari is the other half of uh, Marianne. Marianne was that her name? Princess yes, Trump. It Princess. Was. It was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Until that point, we we were being led that Regina was. We we thought we were going to get another redeemed villain cure, right? That we were going to get uh, Regina. And I don't know the mixed feelings of p- people probably had about that, but I can tell you the <laughs> the old switcheroo. People didn't like that. Yeah, uh, I think uh, like what happened. The the biggest thing that happened with Ace at that time was that uh, we had, prior to her, in some seasons, we had Fresh and Sweet, in which villains turned into cures. So we were expecting that to happen again, especially in a season in which we had a villain that was very popular, and that, like, everything that was happening up to that point led us to believe that Regina was going to be uh, the cure, because everything led to the point for us to believe that she was going to get redeemed. But that didn't happen. Like, uh, like I think that uh, Regina was probably one of the most popular characters in Doki Doki. And up until today, she she is, I think, remembered in Doki Doki mo- more than any other character. Like, uh, in that top that happened in Japan to for you to vote for your favorites, Doki Doki Precure didn't rank in any of, in any of the categories. Like, favorite cure or... It didn't rank as in a favorite season, but it ranked in the side characters. Regina ranked in that. So I feel like she is, she was at the time a very popular character and people were expecting something to happen to her. And well, something did happen to her. She got basically uh, put into the fridge. You know, we didn't see her for like mid season happened. She got into a slumber and she got back to the villain side and we didn't see her for a long period of time. And Cure Ace appeared. You know, we didn't know her. We didn't know who she was. We didn't know what she was doing there. We had no idea who that girl was. And Cure Ace was just there. And I think that one thing that people don't like about her as well, which I particularly love, is the fact that she scolds the Doki Doki girls. You know, she is like, she gets to the team to actually show them this is how you have to do it this is how it's done let me show you you know and that's incredible i love that about cure ace but yeah most people don't like that i understand also uh she has when she initially appears um she kind of tries not to show it but she can only hold her transformation for five minutes and each time she uses her attack that it decreases it even more um, and that's when they had to go find uh, whatever that item was in the mirror in order to um, to make the make her more complete. Yeah, uh, like uh, I, in Doki Doki, there were three different items that they had to collect, which was a nice thing, by the way. It, it reminded me of an RPG, and I found that pretty cool. And when they collected a crown, that that made her power complete, and she was able to hold her transformation for as long as she wanted to. So that was a yeah. nice part of her. I liked that. Yeah, and I mean, with all due respect, if it hadn't been for her, I don't think the other four girls would have gotten stronger at all. Oh, I mean, they definitely. were kind of just... They, they were kind of just... Defeated. Yeah, they were just kind of frolicking along, but... Yeah. And uh, let's just say that Cure Ace has one of the most beautiful Precure transformations ever. Her transformation is incredible. Um, there was also there was also that scene in uh, I can't remember if it was twenty two or twenty three. So I think she, I think she I think Ace showed up at the end of twenty two, and even that battle right there was set up like if the Cures had won, I I was honestly expecting Regina to be brought into the fold right there, <laughs> but instead it's like hi, my name's Ace. <laughs> nice to nice to meet you. And uh, then in the, I, I think it was in the following episode, uh, you know, because she, you know, used her ace shot and and uh, Regina was, you know, very very wounded. Um, 
uh, not love. <laughs> Amana was basically like depressed. Like, so Augury goes, I mean, uh, Ace goes over there and takes away uh, her loved and says, I'm not giving this back to you until you, you know, grow up, you know, <laughs> essentially. Wake up, girl. You have to protect yeah. the earth. You have to protect the world. And you have a friend to save on the other side. Wake up. Come on. Yeah. I totally understand Ace in that, you know. And I like Aguri as a character. You know, I feel I feel like uh, she's a very interesting character, uh, not knowing really who she is and where she comes from. Like she takes a different approach to that, to that. I feel like she is not that type of character who stays on like silently uh, watching the world unfold in front of her. You know, she takes action, she goes and she does things. And well, I think that uh Ace is uh like her relationship with her grandmother as well. I remember that was one episode of her and her grandmother and the grandmother goes to school to visit her and everything. I remember I cried in that episode because that was very beautiful. You know, I feel like her as a character was nicely done and I liked it. I liked it. And they just gave her and the girls just gave her a birthday be just because. <laughs> Why not? Like 42. Why not? Yeah. We all deserve birthdays. We all deserve her, birthdays. And I think our grandmother saw her uh, transform as well. Um, oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think. I think you're right. But also her voice actor is is my favorite uh, voice actor. So You're like a seiyu otaku. Shh. <laughs> Let's go to Happiness Charge. Happiness Charge Precure has my favorite, my particular favorite, mid-season cure. And, like, we're not including Cure Honey here, because Cure Honey was added way early in the season. So I don't think she get kind of, like, can be categorized as uh, a mid-season cure. So She was uh, she was cameoed in the, uh, the in crossover the movie. movie at the time. Yeah. yeah, she was. She was. And then uh, we have our... Beautiful, gorgeous, amazing, stunning. Purple Cure, Cure Fortune in uh, Happiness Charge. Uh, Cure Fortune was also introduced in the first episode. Right at the first fight, in the first scene of the episode, she was right there fighting alongside Cure Princess. But um, unlike Cure Princess, Cure Fortune was very strong. She was very brave. But she had a mission to overcome. So she hated Cure Princess, which was very weak and couldn't fight by herself and everything. And Cure Fortune took a different approach in fighting and a different approach in being a cure in Happiness Charge. And uh, at mid-season point, like during the season, we get to know a little bit of Iona as a character, what happened to her, what happened to her sister, what made her become Cure Fortune. And mid-season, she has a very, very important battle against the Precure Hunter, and at that moment, Cure Fortune is destroyed, but she is also reborn, and she gets introduced to us, the viewers, as Cure Fortune, actually, because we see her in some episodes here and there, we see her fighting in some episodes, we see her acting, but we don't see much of her, and we don't see her transformation. And then, mid-season, she loses her transformation item, but then she gets it back in a different item. So she gets the power back in a different item because the girls help her. The girls use their power to help her, and the, the cards they collected to make a wish, and she made a wish to become Cure Fortune again. And, like, for me, that's, that's a very beautiful moment in Precure history. Because I love Cure Fortune and uh, I love the episode in which she becomes Cure Fortune again. You know, that fight was big, the fight was huge, and it was important to her because there were like, uh, there's an emotional investment in that. And um, episode 22, right? And she was like emotionally invested in that fight and she was able to overcome. Uh, her her sadness and she was able to trust the girls for the first time when they gave her their powers and the cards they collected so that she could become Cure Fortune again. And honestly, I think like up until today, she is my favorite mid-season cure and her introduction was incredible. You know, uh, the way she fought the Precure Hunter was amazing. She 
she's super strong and I love her powers. I love purple. I love stars. And then you bring those two things together in one. It's just everything to me. I, I have to say I was surprised uh, that, you know, we already knew that there was Cure, cure Fortune and and then suddenly, you know, she's stripped of her powers and then voila, it's like, haha, I have a one up. You know, <laughs> I've got an extra life. She, and she becomes she becomes her again but of course she has new powers and it was a uh, i guess a a a, a a power born from friendship love whatever you want to call it yeah and well cure fortune also had a tambourine which is also <laughs> another thing that makes her incredible to me you know she used the tambourine to make her power then her power was super strong i loved it and you know over the the course of the season she was a very strict person with herself and with others and then she learned to open up she learned to understand your princess to to understand Hime a little better and to understand where she comes from and how she was trying to do her best as well and you know she ends up accepting them accepting her and accepting the other girls as well and ultimately i think that her relationship with with them is very nice it was explored very nicely i liked that and in a way i think that cure fortune's uh story arc is more or less uh the same as cure moonlight in a lighter tone because you know she also lost her powers as cure moonlight but she didn't have to have her companion mascot killed <laughs> to get her powers back and uh, she also had a, a family member being disappeared that was actually captured which was her sister who was cure tender who appeared later and even fought alongside her but for that she had to fight against her sister as well in a very dramatic episode but it wasn't amazing i love that episode so much and um you know, at the end of the day, like, I think that they wrote more or less the same story, but with a very lighter note, you know, she doesn't lose the family member that she loves, she's able to get them back. And she's like, nothing is lost here. And, you know, I just love her. I love uh, her powers. The one thing I think it's kind of lackluster in her case is her transformation. You know, the, the animation of her transformation isn't something that is very in, like incredible. I like her introduction, you know, when she says her phrase, her catchphrase, and then says cure fortune. That's amazing. But before that, I think it lacks a little. Yeah, I was going to say she was a very uh, strict person. And then, you know, after that, she heals things over with uh, Hime and uh, also, you know, gets the courage to go on a date and that sort of stuff yeah well that episode of the date is bizarre to me because like they um when she transforms into cure fortune and starts fighting she like the tone of the color tone of the episode changes and i find that really strange because they gave it like a darker tone a gray kind of tone and i think that they were trying to get to do something very dramatic but it you know it felt so bizarre and out of tune to me i don't know why but you know at the end of the day it, it was a nice episode. It was like a nice way of, you know, showing that she was more open to life after meeting the girls, after getting her sister back. Okay, now we have Go Princess Precure. And we have in Go Princess, Cure Scarlet, our fire diva being born. Cure Scarlet is another case of a villain that became a cure. Uh, she was introduced in episode 13 as Twilight, the villain of this one of the villains of Go Princess. And then in episode 21, she became Toa, her civilian version. And in episode 22, she was able to transform into Cure Scarlet. Uh, I think that she is another case of a villain that became a cure in a very dramatic setting of events that were very well written. And like I think that it was beautifully crafted you know the transformation of twilight to cure scarlet was very very beautiful and after cure scarlet you know after toa became cure scarlet actually uh the way she dealt with the girls the way she like she was able to learn things with each of the members of the go princess team that was kind of like resemble resemblant to uh what happened to setsuna i think that they tried to more or less do what they did with Setsuna in this case. I mean, even the colors are the same. 
They're both red cures being added in a later setting. And, you know, at the end of the day, Cure Scarlet is an amazing cure. I still remember to this day the battle they had against her, against um, Despair, to get her uh, a little before she became Toa. And that was incredible. When she transformed using the uh, dark... Uh... Wow, you're dark right, perfume. you're right. The dark key and dark perfume. I don't know. Yeah. Like, that was scary at the time. I was scared, and I loved that. And, you know, I Twilight, uh, as a villain, was awesome, and she had, like, um, great design. I love her design as Twilight. And uh, the one thing I don't really, I don't particularly love about Cure Scarlet is her design as Cure Scarlet. I don't like the costume itself. I like, I love the pink hair, but I don't, I don't know. I, there's something about the costume I don't love. I, I, I feel like she doesn't look like a precure to me. Like the costume <laughs> doesn't look precure ish to me. But she's amazing. I love her powers, and you know, her fire powers were. I like all, yeah, I like all fire cures. I like her power. I like that and everything. I just don't like the weapon. <laughs> Yeah, like it's, I, it's, the it's, idea of a weapon being a violin is incredible, right? Like the idea was awesome, but the way it was drawn, yeah, oh, no, please, the, just the way it was rendered, it it looked plastic. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I I think that the one moment though that I did like is where they were washing the bed sheets, and she was with uh, Kirara, and they were down by the river. Uh, I think, or they were they were chasing the sheets. I, I forgot. But and then she did the tickle attack. I think that was <laughs> that was the most insane, that was the cutest thing ever. Because that was the first time that uh, that Toa had actually laughed or smiled. Yeah, like yeah, that's that happens a lot with villain turned cures, right? They learn how to uh, deal with emotions because like as before they they lived a pretty strict life with uh sadness and darkness around them all the time and now when they become human and they deal with the cures they get to understand their emotions and they are able to show those emotions and i i find that amazing and um well i said something bad about scarlet's design but i have to say towa's design is incredible i love the design, her design as a civilian girl, and the hair is everything to me. <laughs> or, or when she's in the city and she kind of expects people to do things for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was incredible. You know, the way they set up the character was awesome. And I feel like the her development was amazing, but I feel like the pace of her development was a little messed up because uh, they gave everything they needed to give to her when she joined. And when they got to the when we got to the end of the season, there wasn't much room to work with her anymore. While the other girls were having like mini arcs to finish their own individual stories, she was left with basically nothing. And I feel like I wish they would have like spaced out her development a little better because the one she had was very short and not as big as the other three. It always goes back to uh, uh, Setsuna and passion in that when she was turned or even before then like there was a story that was bubbling there she turns and a, and then a new story continues and all the characters are feeding into that story and all the development is just continuing to go along right up to the end and even at the end <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> so i think in future series they should always use that as a good reference not copy it Okay, now let's talk Mahotsukai Precure with our dear cute girl, Cure Felice. Cure Felice is um, a case in which a mascot or a fairy was turned into a cure later on in the season. Uh, she was introduced first in episode 4 as Hachan, and she became Cure Felice only in episode 22. She is one of those cases in Precure in which... There is kind of like a fairy baby in which they have to take care of and they kind of grow during the season. And that's what happened with Felice. Uh, she was a little cute fairy baby. And then the girls, Mirai and Rico, basically took care of her and she was she started growing. She started, uh, you know, becoming a bigger fairy. 
And at the end of the first half of um, Mahotsukai, we learned that she had a very big power inside of her, which was the Emerald power. And that power was something that the villains were after, and the cures also went, uh, also had to go after. But they already had that power with them in her. Uh, so at the end of the first fight of the big first half of Mahotsukai, she ends up kind of sacrificing herself so that the cures are able to win that fight, and she disappears. And then... Uh, a little bit further on the story, a new set of villains appear and they start attacking the cures. And both of them, uh, Mirai and Riko, are sad because Hachan is no longer with them. But she mir miraculously appears and now, this time, as Cure Felice. Uh, I think that one of the things uh, that set Cure Felice uh, as different from most of the mid season cures was that when she was added, to the season there wasn't like a big happening or a big fight or a big event in the season it was just a regular episode with a regular villain the girls were just missing her and she just appeared right out of the right out of the blue just to you know to become part of the mahotsukai team i think that um the only time it happened be before her was in cure sunshine's case like cure sunshine was also another mid-season cure that didn't have like a big episode in her, you know, and Felice's case was kind of like the same, you know, Felice was very, very powerful. She was a big powerhouse, not only as Felice, but also as Hanami Kotoha, her civilian name. Uh, she had a lot of magic in her. And one of the things, I think the thing I like the most about her, apart from her, her attack, which was pretty amazing, and her transformation that was also very beautiful, is the fact that she was a big child. And she was able to play with her emotions and to play with her magic, to play with her will. You know, she, she was just like, she wanted to be uh, a big child all around. That was fine. And the show let her do that. You know, the show never tried to cut her wings. The show let her play as much as she wanted. She, the show just let her be happy as much as she wanted. She, it was never expected of her to become a mature person. And there was also a big shift in her case because when she transformed into Cure uh, Felice, uh, she became like more of a mature person, serious and powerful. And when she was Hachan, she was more playful. She was a big child. I loved that. So whenever they, whenever they, whenever the uh, transformations aside, uh, all, I mean, Felice's transformation aside, all the transformations uh, in this particular Mahotsukai series, uh, they all appear to be much more mature when they transform. That's a given. But then, it's it's like their attitude also evolves as well, and Felice especially <laughs> is the night and day one because you know she's a little kid and then now she's like this badass like uh, more or less uh, not really adult but pretty close to that. Yeah, she's like a goddess when she transforms. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. and I like her transformations. It's so colorful. The music, the plants sprouting and then she blooms out of a flower oh my god that's and and then her eyes open that's really cool incredible incredible yeah her transformation is like probably one of the best transformations as well i think that she is she holds a high position on transformations in general and i know you don't like her debut episode but i know when she debuted in the episode she like kicked, kicked the monster's ass <laughs> i mean yeah, of she course she, of course she would but i mean it <laughs> yeah. was just <laughs> yeah Leah, i yeah, I don't like it. it it's underwhelming. You know, I, I like when we have like big, big episodes in mid-season cures. Like that, that's usually what we get. That's usually what we get. And in her case, it just, it was just very lackluster to me. It was very lackluster. But yeah, I, I do like Felice a lot. And she was a great addition to this season. Yeah, she, she wanted to, you know, make people laugh with her magic or be happy with her was wasn't it? either one but yeah, yeah it was it was funny when she moved into 
into the house and like drew her bed and everything. And <laughs> yeah, made, that episode made, was awesome. <laughs> I loved it. Made oh, the, made Rico like really really jealous <laughs> because even yeah. she can't do magic like that. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Felicia was nice. But now yeah. let's move on. Let's go to the next season. Kira Kira Purikya a la mode, and let's talk about Cure Parfait. Cure Parfait was CL, and it really shows the passion that Toy Animation has for friends, because she is a character that, you know, studied in France, and she has lots of French mannerisms and the things she says, and she was introduced in episode 19 as CL, and in episode 23 as Cure Parfait. Cure Parfait was born in episode 23, and uh, she had a big, big role in this season, which was uh, she and her brother were big parts of this story. Both of them studied a lot and wanted to become free cures. They admired the cures a lot. Uh, but unfortunately, her brother ended up succumbing to the other side because he wasn't being able to become successful as CL was. And at that time, CL was, you know, becoming more and more and more successful and he stayed in, in his own place. And she ended up sparking something in him that made him go to the other side. I have a friend who says CL is the biggest villain in Kira Kira. But, uh, you know, CL turned into Kira Parfit in episode 23. And I absolutely love, love, love her. You know, in, in Kira Kira, each cure has her own themed animal. And in Parfit's case, it's not really an animal. It's kind of like a unicorn, a pegasus. I think it's a unicorn because it doesn't have wings. I don't know the difference between those mythical animals, but it's not a regular horse. You know, it's, she's not a regular horse. It's a unicorn. Oh, yeah, it's a unicorn. Okay, so uh, one thing that uh, it's, is interesting about Cure Parfit, she is the first rainbow cure. She, I don't know if she's still considered the only rainbow cure because we never really had a confirmation on Cosmo's official color. But she, so far, she is the only officially uh, confirmation. She, she's the only official uh, rainbow cure, and she has a great design. She, her design is very colorful. There is like a hint of green uh, being like her biggest color in her, but she has lots of color in her, lots of colors in her costume. And, you know, she really looks like a parfait with levels in it, you know, and uh, her shoes also, her shoes, the platform in her shoes. Come on. That's amazing. Yeah, it's got kind of a 70s waitress type of <laughs> look. Retro. Yeah. Yeah. Even the hairstyle. Has yes, that same you're right. Way. Yeah, it does. It, you know, her hairstyle really reminds me of uh, a Sunday. You know, the format of the of the cup you put the Sunday in. The hair really reminds me of that. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, there was a lot of drama when she became Cure Parfit. You know, her brother was a villain, but you know, he had a lot of good inside of him, and he was, you know, coming back to the. To the light and unfortunately he had to um sacrifice himself to protect her and that sparked her power her inner power to become curious cure parfit and from that point on she fought a lot to bring him back and eventually he became he got back he helped the girls he's kind of a helper in this season but you know cure parfit is the one that's the mid-season cure and i love her you know uh she's like I think they played a lot with her. She like her transformation is awesome. It's very creative and her power, her individual attack is also very creative. They played a lot in that. And you know, that's incredible. That's really incredible. Uh when she transforms for the first time when she like mixes everything in sight pretty much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There was a very interesting way. A little of this, a little of that. <laughs> that was like, yeah, Kira Kira really had some pretty wild ideas and they really used it to their maximum. They were very creative. Like, it's a very peculiar season. I think that's one of the reasons I love it so much. I, I think the one thing I, I like about her the most, though, is it's like she headbutts people. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah, I you know, uh CL is 
like a very nice character you know she she has a human form she has a mascot form she has a cure form she's super powerful as well she has an episode with yukari in which they fight over like the domination of a place in the forest <laughs> and like that episode is so random it's one of the most random episodes in precure i just can't with that yeah now that you mention it she does kind of feel like she's what milky rose should have been but yeah in a way yeah i think well they share some similarities in a way yeah. i think yeah yeah okay let's get to the other one which is hugto precure and in hugto we didn't have one but two mid-season cures we had cure amour and cure mashiri cure amour was introduced in episode seven as ruru a villain and cure mashiri was introduced in episode nine as emiru uh, they are for the first time we had a duo being introduced mid-season uh, we have two cures being introduced at the same time and they are actually a duo they're not really individual cures they transform together they attack together they do everything together concerning the cure uh cure part of their lives um and so uh i i believe that this is probably one of the most lackluster introduction episodes like in hugto uh when hugton and harry came from the future they had four pre-hearts the item the transformation item of the season and so they gave it to the three girls and so when the season was progressing amur uh ruru and emiru became very close friends and emiru did not want to become a cure without ruru they wanted to be cures together and so uh in a regular episode uh, they had only one pre-heart, but they really wanted to fight. And so a miracle happened. The power of mother uh, made the pre-heart become two pre-hearts. And so they were both able to become Cure Amur and Cure Mashiri. Uh, I think that like this is very pre-cure. You know, this is a very pre-cure thing. You know, a miracle happens based on the powers of your emotions, based on the powers of the things you believe in, the things you want to be. And Hugto had a lot of that, right? Who you want to be and everything like that. Um, and uh, like seeing them as individuals, Amur was interesting because she was a villain and then she turned into a cure. She also had a very big relationship with the main character, which was Hana. She lived in her house for a while, not for a while, for a long time. And, you know, she started learning more about human emotions and everything. And Mashiri, on the other hand, is an, a human with lots of emotions, lots of emotions she like i think that they're big opposites in this aspect like they are like she shows everything she is completely insane and i love mashiri as well she is also one of my favorite cures and uh she is completely wild <laughs> you know everything about her is completely insane and um even though like i don't like their episode I don't like the the introduction of them in the series. I think that if we go back to all of the, the seasons, that was probably the most lackluster episode of out of all of them. She, uh, both of them, like they were. There was just a regular fight in which Curiel was fighting by herself, which was pretty okay for Hugto. And then they just they were they were just there, you know. They were just there, and they wanted to become cures, and they ended up becoming cures. But at the end of the day, I really liked them. I really liked seeing them as a duo. I like both of them as cures. I think they added a lot to Hugto. I liked their plots, you know, afterwards as being idols, as being artists and playing and writing music and composing music. That was awesome. You know, I think that they brought a lot of life that Hugto was needing desperately. For me, like we had... Uh... Like we had Heart Catch where we had two cures that were debuted in the latter part of the season, and then we had Sweet that had two cures that but never any that at the exact same time. Uh which I thought was kind of risky, but um some people say it worked and some people say it didn't. Um so I'll leave it up to you. But uh I personally think that's cool. I don't think it probably should be done again. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I 
as I said, uh, the problem I have was with the the tone of the episode itself. Because I like mid-season cures coming in critical times, in big happenings. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and like that that was the the only problem I have with those two. Like hmm. there wasn't a big build up to their birth as cures. And even though, as, as I said, I like the miracle that made two pre hearts, but that was it. You know, like the the transformation itself like the 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 reason they tra they transformed they became cures wasn't strong enough to a mid season cure in my opinion so like that part for me is the biggest letdown but uh, apart from that i liked it i like the idea of adding a duo in mid season you know it was the only time it's been it's been ever done in pre cure mm -hmm. and i think that both of them they complement each other very well so i like that about Amur and Mashiri. You know, they're very different. They're polar opposites. But they yeah, I guess each the, other. I guess the, the mixed feelings I have about it is that it's always supposed to be mid-season cure, singular, or sixth ranger, yes. you know, singular. Yeah. And, and and we get a duo thrown in, and uh, it, it... Yeah, it feels different, right? But, you know, like, I'm a Jiminy, so I like when things are different. I like when we have different ways of you know showing like like we have a pre-established thing which is the sixth ranger and then we give it a twist i like that so i yeah. i like the idea you know uh i just as i said i didn't like their introduction but apart from that from then on i liked them as a duo from from the that moment they entered the season onwards that was pretty interesting i liked it yeah it just it felt like the uh was it the hawaiian uh international cures that teamed up with the uh, happiness charge it's what it kind of felt like but i mean not to say that's what it was just you know a, a duo that was just suddenly thrown in sort of yeah i think yeah hug till wasn't really too keen on lore you know story and like okay we need to do this let's do this let's let's create something here to include them and that that's what it is you know but yeah uh i think that uh hug till was in need of a character like mashiri and it was also in need of a character like Rudu because Rudu was also very rude because she she like <laughs> she didn't have emotions and so she didn't have this human um I don't know how filter. to say that yeah she doesn't have a filter she doesn't know how to deal with social situations she's very objective in everything so she like she gets on with um her own mind and her own like there isn't a, an emotional train of thought there. And she learns how to deal with emotions because of Hana, but also because of Emiru and the music they produce together. That was nice, you know. I, As I said, a nice twist to the idea of a sixth ranger. And I liked that. And ultimately, as I said, I think that uh, Hugto was needing uh, something like both of them. And I think they mixed things up. I really liked their episodes and, you know, at the end of the day, I think they brought a lot of life to Hukto, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, so we're on to our last mid-season cure, at least so far. We're probably going to have one to talk about soon. But for now, let's talk about Star Twinkle Precure and Cure Cosmo. Cure Cosmo is also another interesting case. She was introduced in episode 15 as Uni and then in episode 20 as Cure Cosmo. She has lots of different forms. She has her form as a space thief who was called the Blue Cat, who was famous all around the universe. She was also uh, an space idol. Like, how cool is that? She was also a space idol called uh, Space Idol Mao. And she was also Uni, uh, a girl, a regular girl who used a perfume to transform into those other forms. Uh, Uni had also different forms. She had kind of like a human-ish form of Uni that she used alongside the season. And she also had her real form, which was kind of like a furry, <laughs> a furry creature, right? Don't don't forget Bakanya. Bakinyan, yes. Also, yeah, she was also part of the villain group for a while as Bakinyan. Yes. Oh, my God. I almost forgot that. Yeah. So uh, Uni is a very peculiar case. And I like that. You know, uh, I like that 
in like so after so many cures they can still do things differently and in cosmo's case um i feel like cosmo was a fresh take on the sixth ranger as well uh because uh what we usually had so up until this point was we have a new character coming in and then they welcome her into the team and she becomes a part of the team that's it but cosmo's case was different uni is a cat a cat like human she's like a humanoid version of a cat i don't know how to say that but you know she acts like a cat so she's an she, alien she's an alien yes she <laughs> comes from the rainbow planet <laughs> and um like she is she acts like a cat. She, they kind of gave her the cat personality right and you know when she wants to be around the girls she is around the girls when she wants to be by herself she is by herself she's cunning she's smart she knows how to read the situation easily when she does not want your shit she's not gonna get your shit she's gonna go to sleep <laughs> you know she that's what she, that's who she is and you know i loved that about her that like the story didn't try to bring her into the team it was never a five girl team it was always floor four plus one and that worked awesome with the way she was and the personality and everything that was amazing and she also had like big big stakes for being part of this team and for becoming cure cosmo like she had a big purpose in becoming cure cosmo i loved that yeah and uh, you made a comment earlier uh, about uh, when you were talking about Parfait that you didn't know that if uh, Uni was a rainbow and uh, Toy did in the uh, Halloween episode say that she was Mihoshi blue. So we'll just yeah, assume yeah. she's a blue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I said that because like uh, yeah. for me right now, I, I would consider her a blue cure, but I yeah. don't think that Toy would put her as Mihoshi rainbow. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, Mihoshi uh, rainbow. <laughs> yeah, but I think I, I'm not sure. Like I, I think I still believe she's a blue cure. I still believe Parfit is the sole uh is the sole rainbow cure we have. But yeah. For now. Yeah. Yeah, at least for now. But uh yeah, Uni I don't know, she was she was an interesting character. Uh I have to say, whenever I first saw that she, <laughs> she was Iwern's uh butler, I guess. I don't know, caretaker. Uh Wow, that when when uh when Fua yeah when Fua was like not afraid. Uh, yeah, then, you're right. You're right. Yeah, everybody was like, huh? And then and, and then she's like, it well, happened. the gigs up. <laughs> yes, like that was so well thought. Like Star Twinkle also had some pretty interesting ideas, and they worked with some things that were never done before. And it's interesting because like Precure, so many years after us having Precure, they're still bringing new stuff to the table. And I love that. And, you know, ultimately, um, Cure Cosmo, I praise her a lot. So I'm going to say something I don't like about her. Uh, I also love her transformation. Her transformation is awesome. But I don't really like her attacks. You know, uh, as I said, Uni is a very active character. She is, like, always, like, she's she always knows how to get out of a situation. She always... She, she can steal things from you. You will never notice. And, you know, she can do awesome things. And she stole the pens of the girls when she wanted to use them. That was amazing. But um, when it got to her attacks, we just had a simple perfume as her weapon. And that was so underwhelming because it didn't give her any action. She was just stiff there, just pressing the button on the perfume to spray perfume on the, on the monster and create her attack. Yeah, it was pretty linear, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. And yeah, you know, if it were a different character, like for example, if it were Cure Celine, that would work. But it 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 just doesn't match Cosmo. You know, the item itself, the perfume itself is beautiful. And the fact that she uses the perfume to disguise as other people is also beautiful. But unfortunately, as a weapon to her, I believe that it was a big no-no for me. Like that's that's basically the only bad thing I have to say about her because I pretty much enjoyed her throughout all the season. I love, I love she, Jimmy. She did give us mini meme faces though. <laughs> she did a lot of them. 
<laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, she also followed the route of some of those mid-season cures because she had an episode with each of the girls and she learned things with each of them yes. in different episodes. She also followed that route and that was pretty nice. And as I said, again, a different take because uh, even though she followed, she learned new things with the girls, she never really felt like part of that group she never really integrated that group she didn't really care about that at all you know she had like bigger things to work for <laughs> and that was pretty amazing well she saw them as a means to an end i mean she was yeah, trying like, to restore her planet yeah and obviously there were feelings involved she got involved with the girls we can see that in the last episode and how she was talking to lala when they were grown up you know she she was remembering the things they did together and everything but ultimately, like her her main role there was to restore her own planet and her own people. That was pretty nice. I enjoyed that a lot, and I liked her story. You know, I like when they give those fourth, the the six rangers a different storyline that they have to work for, which isn't really, which might not be really the same goal as the others. Yeah, and I guess she's our first and only like anthropomorphic cure i guess you'd say yeah you're right you're right in a way yeah she is unfortunately we didn't get to see much of that she used uh, her civilian form for the most part but yeah she had the furry version of herself that looked pretty awesome i'm sad <laughs> that we didn't have more of that and then just just for pure spite they had to have a doggo a doggo cop girl <laughs> <laughs> that went after her i absolutely love that episode because like, <laughs> i think that like um when the, the point that they were trying to make in that episode was basically like stealing is wrong don't do that kids but she just gave it a big like fuck you to that and said no i'm gonna keep stealing whenever i want to because like later on in the movie she was just using her cat persona to steal things like as she wanted to you know but like the story gave her a bigger motive to steal, obviously, and I think that even even though like she was kind of like a Robin Hood of some kind because yeah. she was stealing things that were uh, originally from other people, from her people actually. Yeah. But uh, but you know, Toy needed to make a point, like kids stealing. Stealing, stealing is bad. Stealing is bad. But she was like, I don't care. I'm going to keep stealing because I'm the best. You know, <laughs> that was amazing. I loved that. So those were the mid-season cures we have so far. Uh, now with Healing Good, we know that Cure Earth is coming. We don't know when because Healing Good is on a hiatus. We don't know how things are going to be with the calendar and everything. But we know she's coming at some point. We already see her design. We already see her civilian form as well. We are able to look at that and create our own ideas, create our own theories. If you want to share your theories, you can do it in a special video here on the channel concerning theories about Cure Earth. And, you know, I think you would like to share something about her as well. Uh, yeah, the, ta the, the take I, that I got about her is just seeing her overall civilian design. She looks more of a, like a Western type kind of like maybe she's half and half kind of like uh Urara or um not really alice i wouldn't say alice um what other CL girls maybe we... cl maybe yeah and, that's... well let's just not forget the love the toy has for friends right oh yeah i don't know what that is what that's about but uh i'm sure there's some you know thing joke around the office about it or something but um <laughs> uh, but I'm I'm of the opinion that that's kind of like where she is. So either she was maybe she's originally from the area. She went to you know maybe boarding school or something in in uh, in France, and now she's back. And we were about to have the festival episode, uh, the town festival. And my theory was that they were going to run into one another there, and uh, you do some social interacting, and then uh, then then the next day. You know, she shows up. Hi, I'm the new student. Uh, nice to meet you. And everyone, and then Hidata's like, you know, ah, you know, and then, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe she's kind of like a unofficial or kind of like a friend, but not like in the precure club. And then events steer towards. Eventually, she gets into 
either a situation or she's going to be like Chiyu in the wrong place at the wrong time and see something. And eventually she's probably either they're going to be in trouble. They can't fight. And then she's going to beg Latte for power. And then, you know, some, something along those lines. And, uh, and it probably has something to do with, uh, uh, Miss Doggo Queen releasing the statue power. I don't some, something along those lines. I don't think she's going to have a uh, a uh, healing stick or anything like that. I'm thinking it's going to be something else, and and Latte is just going to you know just kind of be there. Yeah, let's not forget they need to sell more toys. Yeah, I think it's I think toys. I think it's going to be something more along the lines of like how Ai Chen gave Cure Ace her you know dress up yeah or... yeah i agree with you i think it's going to be more or less the same i the same vibe i think that there are going to be lots of vibes uh concerning ace in this case because the the, the relationship is going to be very similar like the 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 relationship cure ace had with ai chan it's probably going to be close to asumi and latte it's also very possible that all of this elemental power they've been collecting to heal latte eventually may bring out a new power cure earth power so yeah it might happen yes you're right you're right yeah and so i think we're getting to an end we ended up becoming like bigger than expected i think but it was nice it was a nice talk it's always interesting to talk about mid-season cures and you know sharing our views on them as we always do. Yeah. And as we always say, we always end up talking more than we need. <laughs> but yeah. that's part of it. That's part of the fun, I think. Uh, so um, if you'd like to have your own opinions made, please leave a comment and talk about your favorites, uh, your favorite mid-season cures, your favorite moments of them, your favorites, uh, your favorite episodes in which they appear, your favorite everything about mid-season cures me and inu are always on twitter and if you'd like to follow inu on twitter uh his link will be on the description box and well i think that's it right right thank you so much for listening to us and until next time stay safe bye-bye bye-bye